everybody, welcome to The World This Week. The Iranians raising the bar and the stakes on the nuclear deal. A piece of history, Obama and Castro actually talk. Another case of a white police officer killing an unarmed black man in the U.S. And Hillary Clinton is running for president. These are some of the issues we'll touch upon this Sunday. With me this Sunday are Alon Pinkas, former advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Barack and Barbara Paul Rome, Defense News Bureau Chief in Israel. Hello, both Hello. of you. Barbara, Hillary Clinton, are you excited? Yes, listen, it's going to be, um, it's going to be an interesting race. First of all, she's a, a female candidate. She has such gravitas behind her. And she is prudent, liberal on social issues, and very, very prudent hawk on um, foreign um, policy issues. And Iran is a case in point. Last week, uh, several, 50, actually, foreign policy luminaries, so the a veritable who's who in American um, foreign policy, they called on Congress not to act in any way that would jeopardize this uh, um, uh, framework agreement and the possibility of a final agreement with Iran. And of those um, signators, uh, so many of them were um, protégés and associates and um, um, co-workers of Hillary Clinton. Right, so right. She hasn't spoken about this uh, specifically yet, but look at the welcome uh, by the Republicans. Hillary Clinton has some explaining to do. Used her personal email account to conduct official business. Wanted to reset relations with right. Russia. Not really working out well. Potentially catastrophic move for Hillary Clinton. Taking millions of dollars from foreign governments. Landing under sniper fire. It was a total crock. It was a lie. What difference at this point does it make? Alon, does she have a chance? Yeah, of course. I think she has a better than 50% chance. She has one major thing going for her and two or three things going uh, working against her. The one thing going for her is that America primarily is is seeing a democratic majority, a natural democratic majority. And secondly, uh, she carries the weight of the Clintons. And that works for her in terms of name recognition, face recognition, and familiarity it also, to an extent, works against her. I think she's, she would be a good candidate on one condition and one condition only, that she internalizes and, and, and takes into account the major mistakes she made in the 2008 campaign when she ran first against Obama. Meanwhile, look what's happening with the Iran framework deal agreement and whatnot. Here's the Iranian leader, here's President Obama. We will not let go of our peaceful nuclear technology. Our nuclear facility in Natanz will continue its activity. Enrichment in Natanz will continue. We have over a thousand centrifuges in place in Fordo, and they will remain in place. In Iraq, we will have a heavy water reactor for the production of medicine for medical purposes. What is a more relevant fear would be that in year 13, 14, 15, they have advanced centrifuges that can enrich uranium fairly rapidly. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the breakout times would have shrunk almost down to zero. Alon, what's going on? Um, each side selling uh, the deal domestically. Uh, both have to market the deal. Uh, the Iranians, let's not forget that those who negotiated are the so-called uh, um, moderate, moderate a wing of, of and, and they need to sell this to the Iranian But people. the Iranian leader says, no, no, that's not going to happen, this is not going to happen, Fine. this is not going to happen. And the United States president says they're going to have eventually a bomb in 15 well, years. Well, yeah, if you take those two and you juxtapose them, it looks bad. But and even the, the fact... president said that even the supreme leader of the Islamic Republic has to play to his constituency. Mm -hmm. Right, as, as does President Obama uh, to Congress and to, the, to American public mm -hmm. opinion. Look, no one thought there was a deal when the framework agreement was uh, announced uh, on the 2nd of April. Everyone knew this is going to stretch until the 1st of July or the 30th of June. I don't know if there is going to be a deal. And anyway, I, I think this is insignificant because the, 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 the proof of this pudding is in its eating, i.e., once there is a deal, assuming both sides sell it to their domestic constituencies, the deal is going to live or die on its implementation, not on its text. Bottom line, we're going to have a nuclear Iran. Bottom line is when will this uh, 
nuclear threshold Iran materialize next year or in 15, 20 no, it's years already from now? There. <laughs> Without an agreement, Iran is a nuclear threshold state. It's a turnkey state. All right. Without it's an agreement. It's a turnkey state. But the, the thing more, um, in, I guess, um, more significant to U.S.-Israel relations is the hardball that is being played uh, from both countries. I mean, Netanyahu is doubling down, betting that Congress will kill this deal, and the White House is fighting back very, very hard. And yes, there is a bill in, uh, in, in the Senate, sponsored by uh, the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Senator Corker, that will get out of committee uh, probably this week or next at the latest. But what happens after that is uh, to be determined. It, it might actually die a slow death. Barbara and Alon, I'll say thank you very much, and see you here again. Thank you. When it comes to Iran's nuclear program, there's a lot of jargon and spins flying up the air. So let's try to clear some of that uh, with the help of an expert. This is Chris Bidwell, a senior fellow at the Federation of American Scientists. Thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you for having me, Jacob. Now, how can somebody, uh, let's start with this, determine how far Iran is from making a bomb? Well, somebody, uh, first off, you're not just worried about a bomb, you're worried about a nuclear, a working nuclear weapon, which has three big components, which are not currently being discussed in, in, in full in these negotiations. And it's having the bomb material, which is being discussed, but it's having a weapon system, a triggering device for that bomb, and a delivery system to get that bomb from point A to point B. And it's not an exact science determining how far away Iran is from that bomb. Uh, the information one has to, to make that determination is always, no matter how intrusive and how good your inspections are, it's always going to be incomplete. And because it's incomplete, it's kind of like a puzzle. You've got some pieces, but you will never have all the pieces. The good news is, is that uh, you know a weapon uh, requires a lot of people, a lot of money moving and being transferred, huge facilities to, to build all the component parts, and those are things that are observable. So you can get a sense uh, of, of, of of how a program is developing because of the sheer size and volume of that program. Uh, bottom line, if if you run like. North Korea before really wants to get a bomb, can anybody prevent them from getting one? If they really, really, really want it, you can't prevent it. The problem is, and, and the trick is, making them not really, really, really want it. And this is where, with Iran, you know, uh, economic sanctions, economic exclusion sanctions have put that pressure on Iran to make them not really, really, really want it. Um, and, uh, you know, the inspections that, that are being proposed here can, can help, but they can't absolutely prevent uh, Iran from getting a bomb. They will only help the process to bring political pressure on Iran to not want to get the bomb. Now, uh, critics of the framework agreement say that uh, the facilities are still there, uh, the enriched uranium is there, and uh, therefore, sooner or later, the bomb will be there. Uh, do you agree? Uh, no, for, well, first off, I'm not convinced there is an agreement. I think there's a framework for getting to an agreement or a glide scope that will get you to an agreement, but no agreement. Now, if you look at the outline that the White House put out on April 2nd about where, where this potential agreement could, could end up, there's a lot of roadblocks in there which can be effective and, and certainly slow down or cause Iran to think about how much further it wants to go with, with any potential nuclear program. Now, Israeli Prime Minister says that uh, the world should continue with the sanctions. President Obama said uh, mm -hmm. he never prevented Iran from advancing its, its nuclear program. So, so who's right? Well, in a way, they both are, and, and the question hinges on how you define sanctions. There's, there's two basic types of sanctions. There's, there's non-proliferation sanctions, and then there's economic exclusion sanctions. When talking about the non-proliferation uh, non sanctions, these are things like export controls, blacklisting of individuals and companies. These are roadblocks to getting a nuclear weapon. They are somewhat effective, but there's always going to be a middleman. There's always going to be a banker that helps a determined proliferant get around these things. And so those sanctions are mildly effective on a good day. On the other hand, you have the economic exclusion sanctions. These are highly affected. They work because large multinational companies, insurance, banking, transportation interests, fear being excluded from the U.S. market or having the huge fines like BNP Paribas hit for $9.6 billion. 
Uh, so they don't do business with Iran, and that economic exclusion is what's hurting Iran. That's what brought them to the table. They didn't come to the, to the table because everything was like honky dory and going fine. They came to the table because they want relief from that pressure. The trick is, are they willing to give up their nuclear aspirations to get that pressure relieved? And that's what remains to be seen. Mm. Chris Bidwell in Washington, I thank you very much. Well, thank you for having me, Jacob. Let's take a few minutes to talk about the human brain. Moran Cerf is an assistant professor at the Kellogg School of Management and the New York Science Program at Northwestern University. We caught up with him in a cyber conference here in Israel. Professor Cerf, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Now, I'm looking at your resume, and the first question that comes to my mind is, what's the connection between neurosurgery and business? So it turns out that uh, in the recent couple of years, there's more and more trials to understand how people behave and specifically to predict their behavior in a way that's going to help businesses do better. This means if I know something about your purchases decisions and what intents you use in, in making a choice, I can maybe use that to sell something better or to just communicate some information to you better. So businesses are getting into the world of trying to look at the brain and see what people choose so they can make better products. And how do you translate this to more business? So the business world uh, is all about understanding customers. So the more we know about their brain, the more we are able to make better products for them and sell better. So you can think of all the knowledge we have right now on human biases. Like you, I, I put two items on the shelf and maybe you're gonna buy the cheapest one because you tend to buy cheap. So I put a little more expensive item on the left and you choose the one that's in the middle. All of those biases, the more we know about them, businesses can actually sell better. In your work, uh, you have researched issues such as uh, human perceptions, questions of how uh, uh, we can control our emotions, in short, how that machine works. We know right now that humans have some ability to control their emotions. Uh, this is very different than animals who can experience emotions but can't control them. You, you can't think of a dog who is really interested in not ex exhibiting some kind of happiness and just kind of hiding it. But humans can actually hide emotions or mask them or control them. So this is some kind of operation in the brain that does that. We can now look at the brain and see how people control their emotions and use that to do some things like make people that are unhappy be a little bit happier, make people that are a little bit too manic be a little less. This is one thing we know right now. Now you are uh, in Israel uh, uh, for an international cyber uh, security conference. How will human brain play in the next technological revolution? So I'll give you two answers, two examples. So here's one of them. We now know that if you uh, put a password, you create a password for your Gmail account, let's say, uh, you choose a very long password and you make it very secure and you use capital letters and, and uh, digit and a lot of things, this password is very safe but it's still kept in one place that's uh, easy to get into, your brain. So no matter if you write it everywhere, it's still written somewhere inside your brain. So if we can somehow access your brain and read your thoughts, so to speak, we can actually get access to this password. And now we have ways to do that. We have ways to extract information from your brain just by eavesdropping on the activity of individual cells and see how this password is being coded. So that's kind of one thing. And we can actually use knowledge from neuroscience right now to get information that you yourself know. On the same vein, we can do something that's the opposite. We can actually create passwords that your brain knows that you can actually use, but you yourself don't know. This is a bit kind of ambiguous. So your brain carries a password. You can use it, but you yourself cannot repeat that. You, know, you don't know the password itself. We can do that by making your brain do things that it's able to do without being accessible to you. i give you an example. Uh, kids nowadays uh, play this game called Guitar Hero, where they basically mm. play a little bit of a game and they get right. better in you know, playing uh, some kind of tunes on a virtual guitar. Somehow, they learn how to do better, even though they can't explain what they learned. In the same way, we can actually teach people some passwords that are very long by having them play a game. And while they learn how to play the game, and in doing so, they learn a password, they have no idea what the password itself is. So they can just play a game for a while. The game itself creates a password. They can play the game again and again and do really well in the game. But they have no idea what the password that they played is. This is a way to create a password that can open the nuclear plant or the Gmail account or your bank account without you actually being able to tell the password if asked. Yeah, that's a little bit scary. Uh, so we are in the, in the process of losing control of our brains, actually, if you look at the future. That's a beautiful question. So, so here's my analogy that I always use. 
In 1610, when Galileo Galilei uh, pointed his telescope to the moons of Jupiter, and he was hoping to see them orbiting in one way, and he realized it doesn't work this way, he realized that the Earth is in the center of the universe, and in fact the Sun is, and we're just one more star circling this kind of huge star called the Sun. He was very, very upset about that because it was the dethronement of humankind, that somehow we're no longer the center of the universe. But this actually allowed us to explore the bigger universe. In the same way, we understand right now that we are not the center of our own brain. There's more than one eye sitting in this head of ours, and we're not really, surely, the one that speaks on their behalf. This could be a dethronement of us, meaning we're no longer the center of our own little universe, but in a way, it's the biggest thing we found right now because it allows us to explore the most interesting thing in the world, which is ourself. Mm. This is mind-blowing. Thank you very much, Professor Surf. Thank you very much. Thank you. And this has been The World This Week. We'll see you here next Sunday. Have a great week. Thank you.